Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. The 7-2-2 the seven to two ruling to that effect will probably result in a drastic overhaul of state laws on abortion. Specifically, the court today overturned laws in Texas and Georgia and ruled the government has no right to enter into a decision which should be made by the mother and her doctor. During the second three months of pregnancy, it ruled, a state may regulate abortion procedures, but only to ensure the safety of the mother. And in the last three months, whatever state laws say prevails. Laws in 17 states may be affected by that ruling. Indeed, the ruling did just that. It also sentenced 55 million unborn babies over the next 42 years to death, including well over 14 million African-American children and it overturned centuries of laws prohibiting taking the lives of the unborn. So how is it accomplished? How could a nation that promised the blessing of life and liberty to its posterity, a nation that so treasured its children, become capable of allowing so much of its posterity to be wiped out before birth? Lies and spin. First, the spin. Pro-abortion activists became something everyone could love. Pro-choice. Who could possibly be against choice in America? Once that was accomplished, it wasn't about aborting an unborn baby anymore. It was about a woman's right to choose what she wanted to do with her body. In order to nullify the objection over the human being growing inside the woman's body, and whether that human being should actually factor into the equation, they also began a campaign to dehumanize the human fetus by referring to it as tissue or cells. Marxist socialist Noam Chomsky discussed the value of life as it relates to a human fetus. There are conflicting values and taken in isolation, each of the values is quite legitimate. So the value of preserving human life, or for that matter, the life of any organism, uh, that. Uh, uh, that is a value that we should accept. You shouldn't just go arbitrarily kill some animal because uh, it's fun to kill it. Uh, I th I, that's a reasonable value. On the other hand, most people will agree to swat a mosquito. Okay, well, that, uh, the idea that life is, should be valued has come into conflict with another value. As incredible as it seems, the spin from celebrated leftist Chomsky seems to compare swatting a mosquito with aborting and killing an unborn baby. But his bizarre analogies didn't stop there. Everyone in the debate is opposed to um, outright infanticide, that is taking a live child and deciding to kill them because it's too much trouble to take care of them. Everyone agrees on that. Uh, everyone agrees, I suppose, that uh, women are allowed to wash their hands. Although I suppose, I guess you could make a case if you went over to the biology department that when a woman washes her hands, uh, lots of cells flake off and some future technology might be able to use the information in those cells to construct a potential child. So somewhere between, say, washing your hands uh, and uh, killing uh, your three-year-old, somewhere between that, there, is a decision to be, there are decisions to be made about how we're going to balance what we call life, which in fact is there in the cells on your hand, uh, how we're going to balance what we call life against lots of other problems. If you can get a decent percentage of Americans to believe that taking the life of an unborn human baby is akin to swatting a mosquito or washing your hands, you have won the war. Princeton professor Peter Singer, someone who doesn't have a problem identifying the fetus as human life but also has an even more shocking attitude about abortion. Ultimately, of course, the, the whole decision is based on questions about what you think makes killing wrong. And I think that's one reason why uh, the philosophical discussion with the, with the general public has not got very far because people haven't really confronted that issue. They've tried to say, well, the fetus is a human being or the fetus is not a human being, just accepting the premise that that you know, killing innocent human beings is always wrong. I think if they'd gone a little bit further and said, well, you know, yes, I mean, in one sense, the fetus obviously is a human being. It's a member of the species Homo sapien, and it's alive. Uh, but 
What are the characteristics that make it particularly wrong to kill a human being? Why do we think that killing a human being is normally wrong? And I think if you start asking those questions, you get to see that uh, it's not just being a member of the species Homo sapiens that makes killing wrong. It's rather the fact that, you know, us, you and me, and anyone else listening here, is a being that is has got certain capacities, can think, um, can want to go on living, you know, can, is, is aware of the fact that he or she is living and wants to go on living. And all of those things contribute to why we think that for someone, say, just randomly to shoot people in the street is a terrible thing. But none of that applies to the fetus. The fetus is, well, when most abortions are performed, the fetus is not even conscious. And it's certainly never um, a being who can think, I want to go on living. If the spin wasn't enough, there were also lies. Prior to the Supreme Court ruling that overturned abortion bans in 1973, much was made about the safety of women who were apparently seeking illegal abortions in so-called back alley abortions. One of the most prominent among the activists speaking out for women's safety was renowned abortionist and co-founder of NARAL, which at the time stood for National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, Bernard Nathanson. Nathanson was a man who had overseen some 75,000 abortions at his clinic, performing over 5,000 of them himself. In fact, one of the abortions he personally performed took the life of his own child when he gave his girlfriend an abortion. Nathanson co-founded NARAL to remove the stigma of abortion and to remove all laws that limited it. To do that, he and his group spread the lie that abortion was not a moral issue but a purely medical one. In addition, Nathanson and his allies lied relentlessly and spectacularly about the number of women who had died each year from legal abortions. They claimed to American voters, lawmakers, and judges that women were going to seek abortion in roughly equal numbers, whether it was lawful or not. The only effect of outlawing it, they claimed, would be to limit pregnant women to unqualified and often uncaring practitioners back alley butchers, they said. As a result, Nathanson and the others insisted that America's laws against abortion were worse than futile. They were actually costing women their lives. Nathanson claimed that between five and 10,000 women died each year from illegal abortions. The actual number in 1972, the year before Roe versus Wade, was 39. Antibiotics had greatly reduced the number of deaths from abortion, which averaged around 250. Still nowhere near the figure given by NARAL in the 25 years prior to 1973. How do we know that Dr. Nathanson lied about his numbers? Well, he himself said so. Here's the quote. It was always 5,000 to 10,000 deaths a year. I confess, I knew the figures were totally false. I suppose the others did too, if they stopped to think about it. But in the morality of our revolution, it was a useful figure, widely accepted. Why go out of our way to correct it with honest statistics? The overriding concern was to get the laws against abortion eliminated, and anything within reason that had to be done was permissible. Bernard Nathanson started having a change of heart as soon as one year after the nation's abortion laws were overturned. By 1980, he had given up the abortion industry entirely and eventually became active in the pro-life movement and later converted from atheism to Christianity. But the damage had already been done. The lies had worked. In 1970, a young woman who lived in Texas became pregnant with her third child. She had already given up her first baby to her mother, her second to her father, and now here she was again. She wanted an abortion, but they were illegal in Texas. So Jane Rowe, as she would come to be called in court, found two young lawyers who wanted to challenge the laws. They initially lost their court battles, but appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1973, their case was heard and won when the Supreme Court ruled 7-2 to two in Roe's favor, negating the abortion laws in 46 states. Jane Roe, who, by the way, never had the abortion. Instead, she gave the baby up for adoption. Discussed how her lawyers handled the situation. 
they started pounding, you know, all this. Well, don't you think women should have the right to control their own body? Yeah. They never said anything about, it's really a baby, Norma. You're going to be killing your baby. Don't you know that you're signing an affidavit to execute the next three generations of children to come? They didn't say anything like that. I didn't have a clue. I was ignorant. I mean, I was dumb. Roe, whose real name is Norma McCorvey. She also came to deeply regret her decision and her part in overturning abortion laws. For decades since, she has been a committed warrior in the pro-life movement. It's a bittersweet irony that two of the people most responsible for the legal abortions now in this country, NARAL co-founder Bernard Nathanson and Roe of the Roe v. Wade court case, Norma McCorvey, became adamantly and actively pro-life. 